Hi everyone! In this video, I'm going to show you how to use a variety of different techniques to grow and store uh, bacterial cells. So for example, we're going to start off just by describing how we make media. So this would be the uh, liquid solution that you uh, grow up the bacteria, so it's got to have certain nutrients, it's got to be sterile, so we'll show you how to make that. Then uh, we'll describe how uh, to inoculate the culture, so how to sterilely or aseptically add your cells to the solution without getting any contamination, and then growing them up for a certain period of time to where you've got a saturated culture of cells. And at that point, you can then save some of those cells for later. So if you wanted to uh, restart the uh, incubation, the, the culture at a later time, you would have some cells stored up for that, or how to harvest the cells and then lyse them so you can, let's say, purify plasma DNA from the cells or a recombinant protein. All right, so that's everything we're going to talk about in this video. So let's start off by making some media. Now, there's a lot of different medias you can use to grow cells, and you should really check to see what media is best for your specific type of cell. But E. coli bacteria are usually grown in Luria Britanni broth or LB broth, which is what I'm showing here. Now, you can make LB broth uh, from scratch if you mix together yeast extract, salt, and uh, tryptone. Um, but there's a lot of manufacturers that mix all of those components together into a single powder that's ready to use. And then they say, uh, add 25 grams of this per liter of uh, media that you're trying to make. So for example, in this case, I'm making 250 ml of media, so I'm weighing out 6.25 grams of powder. And then I'm going to add that directly to uh, 250 ml of water. Uh, this could be tap water or ultra pure water, it really doesn't matter for E. coli. And then I'm going to shake that up to mix it as well as I can. Now, I want to point out here a few important things. First of all, note that I'm making the media in the flask or container that I'm going to be growing the cells in. Now, that's very important because I'm, the next thing I'm going to do is autoclave all of this. So by making the media in the culture container, I can simultaneously autoclave the vessel and the media, as opposed to autoclaving media separately from the vessel, then I would have to add the media to the vessel, and that's a potential chance for contamination to enter the culture, which I would not like to have. All right, so whatever uh, culture vessel you wanna use, put the media into that and autoclave the media in place. Uh, the other thing that I want to point out is that this is a baffled flask. Notice that it's got these indentations on the bottom here. Now this is in contrast to a normal Erlenmeyer flask which would have a smooth bottom. What these baffles do is when I shake the culture it will make it very bubbly. It will bring, it will create bubbles or foam in that, in that culture. And what that will do is it will increase the amount of dissolved oxygen that I have in the media. And the more oxygen I have, the faster these cells are going to grow. So that's very important. Don't grow cells in a non-baffled flask. All right. And then lastly, you'll notice that there is still some, some chunks of uh, LB powder floating around here. Don't worry about that. You don't have to dissolve it completely because the autoclave will take care of the rest. Okay, so <clears throat> shake that up as much as you can. Um, but then the next thing that we need to do is cover these flasks because we want to make sure that once they've been autoclaved, uh, contaminants can't just float in through the top opening there. So there's a bunch of different ways to do this. For example, you might have a lid that you can screw onto your flask. Um, but one of the easiest things you can do is put a sponge on top of that uh, in the opening, or you can just cover it with some aluminum foil. Now, if you lose, use aluminum foil, I'd fold it a few times to make sure that it's not going to rip. Um, but all you need to do is fold it and then shape it to the top of the flask here. Now, again, I want to point out that oxygen is very important for these cultures. So you would not want to use here an airtight lid you need to have some way to let oxygen into the solution or into this uh, flask while the cells are growing. So for example, that blue lid that I have shown there actually has an air filter bit built in. Air can diffuse in or out of that flask, but 
it has pores that limit any contaminants from getting in. Aluminum foil is an imperfect seal, so air can get in through there, and a sponge is the same thing. So if you put a sponge in or foam, uh, contaminants can't get in very easily. But you have to make sure that air can get into your culture. Now the only exception to this is sometimes we do very small cultures in, let's say, uh, 50 ml tubes, uh, where you have 5 ml of media and 45 ml of air. There you really don't have an option to let more air in, you just have to trust that the 45 ml of air that you have in that tube will suffice. But you would never want to put 25 ml of culture into a 50 ml tube because there you're trying to grow more cells with less air and that's a bad idea for several reasons. Okay, so anyways, once we have our LB agar mixed up and uh, sufficiently covered, the next thing we want to do is autoclave it. So anytime you're autoclaving liquids, be sure to remember to put them into a secondary container because sometimes these liquids boil in the autoclave and spill over. So you want to be able to catch that in a secondary container instead of leaving a mess in the autoclave. You also want to make sure your lids are loose just so pressure doesn't build up in those vessels. Then you want to select the appropriate preset. So in this case, I want to make sure that I'm uh, autoclaving these samples at 121 degrees Celsius or 250, 242 degrees Fahrenheit here for at least 20 minutes. Now, if you have larger volumes of media, you might want to autoclave for longer. Uh, just make sure you're using whatever is appropriate there. But I would always recommend uh, staying with the autoclave to make sure that it reaches full temperature, uh, just to make sure that you are actually sterilizing what you have in the autoclave. All right, but then you can leave, come back in, let's say, one to two hours, and make sure that you see something on the autoclave that says cycle complete. Do not open the door early because you will get burned with steam. All right, so wait until the autoclave says it's okay to open it, then carefully open that autoclave with the pre proper protective gloves on because everything will be very hot. Close that autoclave back up and then you can bring the media back to the lab in the secondary container. Now at this point, you wanna let the media cool to room temperature before you add cells or any antibiotics. So you could just be patient, leave it out on the bench or in the refrigerator until it cools down. Or if you're in a hurry, you can cool it down in uh, in the sink as well. Just run some water over it and that added convection should cool it down even faster. All right, but once it's cooled down, now you can add whatever antibiotic you need to add. So let's say you're trying to grow cells that have a plasmid for antibiotic resistance, something like ampicillin. What you want to do here is you want to make your antibiotic stock uh, whatever the appropriate concentration would be. So for example, for ampicillin, we make 100 milligram per mil uh, stock of that. And then uh, what we have to do before adding it is even, if, even though it's an antibiotic solution, we want to filter sterilize it to remove any potential contaminants. So here I'm putting my stock into a syringe filter and then or into a syringe and forcing it through a 0.2 micron syringe uh, filter, which is going to retain any contaminants, but it's going to let the antibiotic and liquid go straight through. You wouldn't want to autoclave antibiotics because it might degrade them. So anyways, uh, now that I've sterilized my antibiotic, the next thing I'm going to do is add it directly to uh, my cell culture media. So in this case, uh, for ampicillin, we do a 1 to 1,000 dilution. So if this was a 250 ml culture, I'm going to add 250 microliters of ampicillin to each of those flasks. Now notice that I'm doing this in a biological safety cabinet, which is a sterile environment. I'm also using sterile tips, sterile pipettes, and gloves, because I don't want any contaminants to find their way into these flasks. Um, and it's perfectly fine to work with a BSC at this point, um, because we're not working with cells yet. If this was a BSC that you routinely work with animal cells in, then you never want to bring bacteria in uh, to that BSC because then the bacteria might cross-contaminate your animal cell cultures. Um, but here I'm just adding a sterile antibiotic to a sterile uh, media solution in a sterile flask. So there's no reason I wouldn't do this in a biological safety cabinet to make sure that I'm not contaminating um, my cultures here. 
All right, but then the next steps we perform on the bench because now we're going to be working with bacterial cells. So I don't want to work in that biological safety cabinet. Now, alternatively, you might have a BSC or a hood that you designate specifically for bacterial work. Uh, so for example, that's what we do sometimes is we have a hood just for bacterial work and you would want to work in there because that's another sterile environment. But if you need to work on the bench, if you don't have those other types of hoods, then what you want to do is sterilize the bench as best you can. So what I'm doing here is I'm spraying the bench with 75% ethanol and then wiping it down. And this is going to kill most of what's on the surface. Then I'm going to take a Bunsen burner and light its flame. Now what that's going to do is it's going to suck the room air into the flame, incinerate it, and then hopefully sterilize it as well. So that's going to give you a nice little zone of purified sterile air right there around the Bunsen burner. So if I work closely enough to that Bunsen burner, then there should be fewer contaminants blowing around in the wind. Then I'm going to get my sterile media, tips, and pipette, and then I'm ready to inoculate the media. So in this example, I'm going to inoculate the media from a glycerol stock. For this, you need to pick up a sterile pipette tip, then uh, while grasping the glycerol stock to avoid uh, melting it, you want to scrape the top of that glycerol stock until you've got a little chunk of ice, and then you can eject the tip directly into the media. Now, I do want to mention here that it's not technically necessary to eject that tip into the media. In fact, if possible, uh, I prefer that you just dip the tip in the media and shake it around a little bit. Now that would be pretty hard here with this flask, but if you were inoculating a liquid culture in let's say a 50 ml tube, then that would be a lot easier to do, okay? So if you can avoid ejecting the tip into the media, if you can just dip it and shake it around a little bit and then eject the tip into a tip waste box, that overall is better because what we find is if, if we eject tips into the media, eventually after we're done with the culture, we autoclave the media and then you can dump it down the drain. A lot of times those tips get dumped down the drain. All right, so that's something you can obviously avoid just by making sure the tips don't go down the drain. Um, but if you never put the tip in the media, then you never have that problem later. So just a, a, a word to the wise, all you need to do is dip the tip and shake it around a little bit. If, if you can do that, then you'll make your life easier. You'll make, uh, definitely make our pipes <laughs> work better in the future. All right. Um, also, I'm not showing it here, but inoculating a culture with a colony from an agar plate is essentially the same process. You get a sterile tip, you scrape off one colony, and then you eject the tip or dip and shake the tip into that media. It's really the same thing. All right, so all that being said, once that tip or once that media is inoculated, then we can bring it over to the shaker incubator. So very importantly here, anytime you're putting a culture in, you want to make sure that it is secured to the shaking platform. The last thing you want to do is leave this thing overnight, come in in the morning, and your tubes or your flasks have fallen off and now they're contaminated or they're open and they've made a spill. But anyways, you want to set the temperature to 37, set the rotation to 200 to 250 RPM, and then leave that overnight. Uh, most cultures that are inoculated in this way will be uh, to stationary phase or late log phase after about 16 to 20 hours. And so that'll give you a nice high concentration of cells that you can use for whatever downstream applications you might want. All right, so next, let's uh, show you how to make a glycerol stock. So in this case, uh, let's say I inoculated this culture with a colony from an agar plate, which presumably means that I have a new plasmid that I'm transforming into bacteria for the first time. In subsequent cultures, it would be nice if I didn't have to repeat that transformation step every time I wanted to grow those cells. So what we do here is the first time we transform the cells with the plasmid, we pick up that colony and we put it into a culture. We let that grow up until it's turbid. Then we save a little bit of that liquid culture 
and freeze it, okay? What that gives us is a nice little frozen tube that we can come back to later on, scrape a little bit of that frozen sample with a pipette tip, and then add that to a culture to start a new culture, okay? In that approach, we don't have to repeat the transformation step, which would take one to two days, all right? So that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to take a little bit of this culture, put it into a cryo vial, and then freeze it for later use. But we can't just plop uh, saturated uh, E. coli culture into the freezer and expect that to stay good forever because freezing the cells and then thawing them out will actually kill a large amount of them. So what I need to do first here is I need to start by adding glycerol to this tube. Now glycerol is a cryoprotectant, so it's gonna protect the cells from damage during freeze-thaw. So what I'm doing here is I'm adding 500 microliters of 50% glycerol. I wanna add that to the tube first because glycerol uh, is used for a lot of different cultures, um, so I wanna make sure I'm not contaminating that glycerol. So once I've added that, now I can add 500 microliters of my turbid culture, and here again, I'm working aseptically. I want to make sure that I'm not getting any contamination into this glycerol stock because I'm going to use it for future cultures. But here we go. I'm adding that, uh, that amount of cells to the tube, and then I'm going to mix it pretty thoroughly. All right, just make sure that glycerol is mixed in there so all the cells are protected. Now, once I've done that, or even before I do that, I want to thoroughly label each of these tubes. Okay? So you want to have several useful, important pieces of information on these tubes. First of all, the strain. So this is a DH5-alpha E. coli uh, sample, meaning that it's used for plasmid production, uh, as opposed to BL21 E. coli, which are used for protein production. All right. So you want to have that on there. You want to uh, indicate what plasmid is in the cells, the date that this glycerol stock was made, that's very important because most glycerol stocks, even if you add glycerol to them, uh, the viability of those cells starts to go down after a few years. So you can take a tube out of the freezer and have a general expectation of how many viable cells are in that tube if they've been in there for, let's say, five or six years. There should still be some viable cells, just not as much as if it was one year after you made that stock. Um, likewise, you also want to uh, label this tube with any antibiotic resistance that the cells might have because that will inform you as to what kind of media you need to make um, before adding the cells into that media. All right, and then once you have that tube labeled and mixed, uh, you can then put it directly into the negative 80 degrees Celsius freezer and store it there almost indefinitely. One word of caution though for future use of these glycerol stocks, uh, I didn't mention this previously, but whenever you take a glycerol stock out of the freezer, you want to make sure that you don't let it thaw. Every time a glycerol stock freezes and thaws, some of the cells die. So if you can work with a glycerol stock as quickly as possible, for example, take it out of the freezer, get what you need from it, scrape the tip and then put it right back into the freezer immediately before it thaws, that glycerol stock will last you a lot longer than if you let it thaw every time you take it out. All right, so the last thing I wanna talk about here today is harvesting the cells. Now, if you have a large culture like this, you probably have to uh, dispense that culture into 50 ml tubes so that you can centrifuge the cells. Now, notice here, I've got about a 250 ml culture, and I'm splitting that into tubes, but I'm only putting 40 ml into each one of these tubes. That's because a lot of tubes, no matter how well designed they are, if you centrifuge them at high speed, if you fill them up completely, they will leak a little bit. And that's a pretty bad situation if we're talking about living cells here, contaminating now your centrifuge. So you want to avoid that if you can. So I'm only putting 40 ml in each of these 50 ml tubes. I'm gonna need more tubes, but I'm gonna prevent leaks from happening. All right, so anyways, uh, once I have 40 ml, approximately 40 ml in each of those tubes, I need to balance them. I need to create pairs of tubes here that are the exact same mass 
so that I can put them in the centrifuge in opposite locations to make sure that I'm not damaging the centrifuge. So here I've got two tubes. The second one was lighter, so I'm going to increase its mass by just adding uh, liquid water to that tube. And you can do this uh, pretty easily. It doesn't have to be done under aseptic conditions because presumably the next thing we're going to do is lyse these cells. So here we go. Now I've got my balanced tubes and I'm going to put those into the centrifuge. Again, keep track of which tubes are balanced to one another and make sure those are opposite each other on the rotor. So I'm going to load this thing up and then I'm going to centrifuge at let's say 10,000 G for five minutes. Now different centrifuges are different. You might have to uh, let's say decrease that G speed depending on what the maximum speed of your centrifuge is. Um, but if you decrease that G speed uh, then you might have to increase uh, this, the spin time to uh, compensate for that lower centrifugal force. Um, but we've also got a swinging bucket rotor uh, with another centrifuge and 4000 G's at five minutes is sufficient to pellet cells in, in that type of machine. All right, so here we go. After you've done your spin, this is what you should see in those samples. So taking out one of these tubes, you want to be very careful to remove it uh, slowly so you don't disturb the pellet, but you should see a solid pellet at the bottom of the tube and then above that should be liquid, clear liquid. And you can take that clear liquid and decant it back into the original culture flask. And what this allows us to do then is you can take that culture liquid uh, in that flask and simultaneously autoclave both of those things to sterilize them, to kill any leftover bacteria. And then you can pour the spent media down the drain because it's completely harmless at this point and you can use the flask after cleaning it out for another culture. Um, the cells themselves, you can then take those and freeze them at negative 80 degrees Celsius if you're gonna use them on a different day, uh, or you can use them immediately. Um, but I should mention here uh, that you absolutely should not freeze cells at negative 20 degrees Celsius. Uh, you can actually damage the sample uh, if you're isolating recombinant protein, for example, from these cells, uh, the protein might actually uh, start to degrade or denature even um, at negative 20 degrees Celsius, but you see much less of that if you freeze at negative 80 degrees Celsius. Um, another thing is when you freeze at negative 80 degrees Celsius and then thaw from that extremely cold temperature, especially if you do it rapidly, um, that can actually help to lyse your cells. So that might make cell lysis a little bit easier for you if you can freeze your cells um, before you perform the lysis. All right, so that's just about everything uh, from start to finish, uh, making the media, inoculating it, growing up the cells, and then harvesting them. Um, but there's a lot of different permutations on this. So for growing specific types of cells, you might have to change the variables I've given you here. Um, but these are just general good guidelines or starting points. Um, but then I encourage you to check the literature to see if uh, there's other optimized parameters that you should be using, or even to optimize the parameters yourself, because it might be possible for you to get even more cells or higher yields of plasmid or protein from these cells if you tweak the parameters a little bit. So let's say growth time or growth temperature, or even the media formulation. But there you go. Uh, that should be everything you need to get started. And I wish you luck.